وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin with the praise of Allah and by asking Allah to exalt the mention of grand peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions. What we're going to deal with uh, at the beginning of this episode inshallah ta'ala is the issues around obedience to the parents. Uh, this is something that we have no doubt it's a part of Birr al-Walidayn and it's a fundamental part of Birr al-Walidayn. Uh, we have no doubt that uh, the word Bir itself indicates a ta'a, it indicates obedience. However, how do we reconcile and how do we navigate the issue of obedience to our parents and the different uh, sort of elements that are uh, that are involved in that? So we're going to start with a hadith of uh, Abid Darda. Anna rajulan atahu faqal. إِنَّ لِمْرَأَةَ وَإِنَّ أُمِّي تَأْمُرُنِي بِطَلَاقِهَا قَالَ سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولِ الْوَالِدُ أَوْسَطُ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ قَالْ فَإِنْ شِئْتَ فَأَضِعْ ذَلِكَ الْبَابِ أَوْ احفظ And the hadith narrated by At-Tirmidhi وقال حسن صحيح He said it's an authentic hadith that the parent, he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that the parent is awsatu abwab al-jannah. Awsat here, it said that awsat, it means fil wasat, and it means in all of the doors of jannah, it's the middle one. And it said that al wasat, and this is very common that the word wasat, it means, uh, or awsat, it means afdal, the best of the doors of paradise. And then he said to him, so if you wish, you can lose this door, you can give up this door, just forget about it. I'll dare, like just let it go. Uh, lose lose out on it. If you wish, you can lose out on it. And if you wish, you can keep you can you can protect it. So here the interesting thing is: did Abu Darda answer his question and say divorce or not divorce? What you see from this is that he didn't answer his question. He simply narrated a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. He said, what I know from the Prophet ﷺ is the Prophet ﷺ said that the parent is awsatu abwab al-jannah, the best of all of the gates of paradise. That's what I know. That's what I know. فَإِنْ شِئْتَ فَأَضِعْ ذَلِكَ الْبَابِ أَوْ احفظ. So if you wish to give up this door and lose out on it, if you wish to guard it and make sure that you get it, so ultimately here, uh, what we have is from the statement of Abu Darda is that he didn't really answer the question, but he indicated that the importance of, the, of obedience to the parents, and he indicated that to be considered to be barun lil walidain, to be considered to have birrul walidain, you have to have obedience to them. You have to have obedience to them, there's no doubt about that. So here, we need to kind of sort this out and understand uh, what the issues are relating to the obedience to the parents. So among the scholars are those who said that when the parents tell you to do something which is wajib, which Allah told you is wajib, then it is wajib for you to obey them. And they said that when your parents tell you to do something which is mubah, it's allowed, it's then it's mustahab. But this is not a strong opinion. This is not a strong opinion. So how do we reconcile this? First of all, if they command you to do something which is haram, if they command you to do something which is haram, then it's not permissible to obey them. As Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً and if they strive to make you make a partner with me in that which you have no knowledge of, do not obey them and accompany them in this world in the best way. 
So there is no la ta'ata fi makhluqin fi ma'asiyat al-khaliq. There is no obedience to creation in disobedience to the creator. But if you disobey them in this, if you disobey them in this, then that disobedience, it has to be at the highest, with the best manners and the kindest words and the best behavior. That's if you have to disobey them. And that's if they tell you to do something haram. Because as Allah Azza said, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah Azza put his right first and then the right of the parents. So the right of Allah is always given precedence over all of creation. If they tell you to do something which is mustahab or mubah, it is recommended in Islam to do it, or it is mubah, it's permissible to do, then you have to also obey them. That's the asr. That's the asr. That's the basic principle. If they tell you to do something mustahab or mubah, something which is halal or something which is recommended, you also have to obey them. You also have to obey them. However, the scholars made an exception in one area, that which doesn't involve a harm to the child. So here, uh, we need to define the harm as a dararun, darar al mu'tabar shar'an. It has to be a harm which is given proper consideration in the Sharia of Islam. It has to be the harm that is given a proper consideration in the Sharia of Islam. It can't be just that the child says, oh, you know, like, uh, I'm going to be harmed because I'm not going out with my friends. But the darar, which is mu'tabar shar'an, the harm which is given consideration in the Sharia. Because the Prophet said, la darara wa la dirar. There is to be no harm, accidental or deliberate. There is to be no harm caused to another person. So it is not allowed for the parent to tell their child to do something which brings upon them a harm in the Sharia. A harm which is given consideration Islamically. It's not allowed for the parent to do that. And if the parent commands them to do that, the child has the right not to obey them again bil ma'roof in the way with the best of st- the best standard and the best uh, the best behavior and the kindest words karima and say to them the most noble of words and the kindest of words and the most generous and, and nice uh, words that a person can say so here we'll go back again and we'll summarize again we'll say that as for them telling you to do haram then it's not permissible for you to obey them as for them telling you to do that which is wajib or mustahab or mubah, then you have to obey them. That's the asal. You obey them. You, you should obey them. And it's not like some of the scholars said that it's mustahab to obey them here. La, but huwa wajib. It's wajib to obey them here. Except if they tell you to do something which would bring a harm upon you that is mu'tabar in the Sharia, that is given consideration in the Sharia of Islam. So then, how do we understand this in the matter of the famous mas'ala of my mom told me to divorce my wife? This is a very famous mas'ala as we've heard, the man who came to Abu Darda, and he said that my mom came told me to divorce my wife. There is a narration from Umar that he told his son Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu uh, anhum, uh, he told uh, his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, to divorce his wife, and he did. And he did. And it's also narrated that a man came to Imam Ahmed and he asked about this. And Imam Ahmed said to him that if you have nothing left in, in Bir except this, then do it. I, if you have nothing, if, there is, if you have done every single kind of Bir that you can do to your parents and the only thing left for you is to divorce your wife, then divorce her. But the reality is that this, we can simply understand it in the, in the light of whether it brings upon a dharr upon the person. So, a harm upon the person. So, if it's the case that, like in the case of Umar, that Umar is from the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba about the Sharia of Allah and about what is good for the people. And Umar telling his son, uh, Abdullah, to divorce his wife which person is like Umar? And that's why it's narrated that some of them 
said, which of you has some of the ulama? They said in response to this, which of you has a father like Umar? Meaning that if you have a father like Umar with that amount of knowledge and that amount of understanding and taqwa, then he's not going to tell you something which is going to bring a harm upon you. Rather, what he's telling you is for your good, not for your harm. However, in the case of other parents, there can be, there can be jealousy between the mother and between the daughter-in-law. And the mother might say, if you really love me, divorce her, you, and so on. This is something which happens. And that doesn't mean that the mother is now raised up to the height of Umar ibn Khattab. And now we say to her that, you know, what she said for her son, it has to be good for him. Rather, he should ask his mother the reason for that and say, what's the reason why I should uh, divorce her? Or what do you think is the problem? And when she explains, if that is a valid Islamic reason, she says you should divorce her because I see that she uh, doesn't wear hijab properly or I see that she uh, is bad in the way that she treats you or I see that she has had a bad influence upon you or something like that, then this he can give it consideration. As for if the answer is nothing more than jealousy, then this is just bringing a harm upon him and upon his wife, which is an unnecessary harm. And it falls under the statement of the Prophet you can't cause harm to other people. And therefore he should respectfully and kindly disobey his mother on this particular, on this particular issue. So Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah, he limited the obedience to what is beneficial for the parent and not harmful for the child. Because the parent might ask that the, the uh, son to do something which is harmful for them, which hurts them and the son knows. So the son here can respectfully disagree the daughter she can respectfully uh, disagree in the matters where they know it's going to harm the parents it's not going to benefit them or it's going to harm the child so what about this issue of the father and the mother differing with each other then so in this we have a statement regarding imam malik a man came to imam malik faqal inna abi fi sudan he said my father is in a sudan and sudan at that time and Allah Azza knows best, it referred to Africa in, in general. Wallahu alam, yani without the specific country. Minni an aqdama ilay. He said that uh, he has requested me to, uh, to go to him. That I should go and I should travel to him in Africa where he is. And my mother said, don't go. So what shall I do now? My father says to me, go to Africa. My mother says, don't go. What do you think? Pause the video, have a chat to the people in your family. Let's see how many of you come up with the answer that Imam Malik came up with. So inshallah, you had to think about it. Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, أَطِعْ أَبَاكَ وَلَا تَعْصِي أُمَّكَ He said, obey your father, but don't disobey your mother. He said, obey your father, but don't disobey your mother. And that's obviously a very, uh, it's a very clever way of putting it. But we have to answer the question in a, in a way that is clear for people. And that is that the scholars differed over this issue. Because some of them took the hadith of the mother being three times more deserving of companionship. And they said that this would indicate that the mother should be given precedence in this. And others, they said, rather this hadith, it talks about husn al-suhbah excellent companionship and it doesn't necessarily talk about the issue of obedience per se like uh, obviously obedience is a part part of that but it doesn't necessarily say that the mother or indicate that the mother is deserving of obedience more than the father and Allah Azza knows best but that's what seems to be the correct opinion that the father has the right of being the head of the household and his decisions take precedence over those of the mother. Because in the first place, the father has that authority, that daraja over his wife. وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ daraja. The man has a degree of responsibility over his wife in that regard. And uh, likewise, the man is the one who is mas'ul over his whole family. He's responsible for his wife and his children. And therefore, in terms of his him being the wali, the one in charge, the one responsible, then his is the decision that, that is binding at the end of the day. But the first 
methodology or the first step should be to reconcile between the two. Obey your father, but don't disobey your mother at the same uh, at the same time. So now we come to another issue, and that is the issue of al infaq al walid or al infaq al walidain, spending upon your parents. What's the ruling of spending upon your parents, and what's the ruling of the parents taking the child's money? What's the ruling of spending on the parents, and what's the ruling of taking? The child's money. And for this we have a hadith. The hadith is عن جابر بن عبد الله رضي الله عنهما أن رجلا قال يا رسول الله إن لي مالا وولده وإن أبي يريد أن يجتاح مالي فقال أنت ومالك لأبيك رواه ابن ماجه Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said that the, a man came to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and he said, I have money and I have children. And my father wants to take that money. He wants to take that money from me. The Prophet وسلم, said, Anta wa maluka li abik. You and your money are permissible and for your father. And here the lamb here doesn't mean you belong as such, but يعني, it's, it's allowed for your father. However, the ulama of Islam, they have some conditions. And Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he spoke about this. Uh, and we can summarize it into three uh, areas that we need to talk about. So the first is that the parent has the right for the child to uh, spend upon them uh, and to use their wealth for them under certain uh, conditions. The first condition is that the parent has a haja. Haja to walid ila dhalik. The parent has a need for it. As for him taking that wealth for no need or demanding that his children pay for things for him without there being a need, then this appears that this is not from the, the things that he can demand to take the children's money if he uh, doesn't have a need for it. But if he has a need for it, then we come to the second issue that it, there is no darr there is no harm upon the the child in that so if the child is left hungry or the child is left having to beg or the child uh, is forced to uh, lie or to cheat because of the they, they lost their money then this is not permissible because of the statement of the prophet there is no harm either deliberate or accidental and the third condition is that it should not be oppressive and there should be it should be with uh, with fairness and justice and it should not be done to oppress like to take the wealth of one child to give it to the other child or to take the wealth from one child in order to put pressure on them because you don't like what they've done for example so it should not be the reason for the request should not be uh, zulm, oppression and the way that the money is is used should not be with zulm. it should not be with oppression and if those conditions are fulfilled, then this is when the parent has the right for their child to spend upon them. They have a haja for that, a need for it. Um, and there's not a darura, it's not a necessity, but a haja. They have a need for it. And we're not saying that the parent is at a stage where they have nothing left to eat and they're in a state of being completely poor. But they have a haja, they have a need for it. And it doesn't harm their child to give it either the harm to the child, that is the, the shara'i harm doesn't happen to the child, and that it's not being taken for the purpose of oppression, either to take it from them to push them into doing something, or to take it from them to give to another uh, to give to another child. And uh, our mother Aisha she narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam inna auladakum hibatu Allahi lakum yahabu liman yasha'u inatha wa yahabu liman yasha'u dhukur. فَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالُهُمْ لَكُمْ إِذَا احْتَجْتُمْ إِلَيْهَا Aisha narrated from the Prophet ﷺ that he said that your children are a gift from Allah to you. And then he recited يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثَ وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورِ Allah gives whoever he wants females and gives whoever he wants male children. I as a gift. And we had mentioned this before in the topic of children. So they and their wealth is allowed for you, ilakum, it's for you, if you have a need for it, when you have a need for it. 
And so here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he limited this and he restricted it to the time when there is a need for the parent, where the parent has a need for it. As for the parent just taking it like that, then we say that no, this is not what is indicated by the text. The text indicate that there should be hajatul walid ila dalik. The parent should have a need for it. So now we come to the issue of birrul walidain if the parents have passed away. And here we're talking about the Muslim parent now. During the lifetime, wasahibhuma fi dunya ma'rufa. If they're non-Muslim, be around them, accompany them, give them good companionship in the dunya. As for when they die, then their rights cease, Allahumma except one, and that is if there is no one left to bury them, if there is nobody left to bury them except the Muslim child, then they have a right for the Muslim child to bury them. And that's taken from the narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib, when the Prophet ﷺ told him to go and bury his father because there was nobody who would take that responsibility, and there was no one else to take that responsibility except him. So here, uh, the rights of the non-Muslim parents, they cease at the time of death. When they pass away, they have no more right from you. Except that one that is mentioned from Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is that if there is nobody else that is willing to take their funeral arrangements, responsible for, for, their bury, for burying them, then the Muslim child can take the responsibility for doing that without any other religious practices. Yani not, to, not in the way that other religions do. As for the Muslim parent, no. They continue after the parent dies. And from this we have a hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Min abarril bir, from the greatest examples of bir, an yasil al rajulu ahla wuddi abihi ba'da an yuwadli. That for a person to keep good ties with the people that his father loved after he had passed away. And the hadith in Sahih Muslim and others. Subhanallah. Look at how amazing that the level of Birr al Walidain is. That even when the father passes away, that the, the, the son or the daughter looks after the friends of the father. The people who the father was friends with and the people who the father loved and was close to. They still keep ties with them and they still look after them and they give them, they take care of them. They even take care of their father's friends and their mother's friends after they pass away. And uh, Abi Usaid Malik ibn Rabi'a al-Sa'idi, he said, بَيْنَا نَحْنُ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذْ جَاءَهُ رَجُلٌ مِنْ بَنِي سَلِمَةٍ he said that when we were with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man from Bani Salima came and he said, He said, Ya Rasulullah, Hal baqiya min birri abawayya shay'un aburruhuma bihi ba'da mawtihima. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is there anything left after my parents pass away that I can be to bir towards them, birr al-walidayn after they pass away? Qala na'am, he said, yes. As-salatu alayhima. You can make dua for them. وَالِسْتِغْفَارُ لَهُمَا And you can ask forgiveness for them. وَإِنْفَاذُ عَهْدِهِمَا And you can fulfill the promises or the, the agreements that they have made. مِنْ بَعْدِهِمَا After they have passed away. وَالصِّلَةُ الرَّحِمُ أَلَّتِي لَا تُوصَلُ إِلَّا بِهِمَا And you keep ties with the family members that the link between you and them is through the parents. وَإِكْرَامُ صَدِيقِهِمَا and that you are generous and kind to their to their friends. Some of the ulama they said uh, this hadith is hadith on da'if. It has a weakness in it. However, the points mentioned are all valid. The points mentioned are all valid, and it's an excellent summary of the points uh, in terms of what you can do for the parent after they pa pass away. So, first of all, you can make du'a for them. You can seek forgiveness for them. You can fulfill the promises and oaths that they had made after they die. You can keep uh, ties with the relatives. That you, the ties between you and them are your parents. So you, the, the parents is the reason why you keep those ties. And you can be good to their friends and the people that they and the people that they loved. And as we said, some of the some of the ulama they mentioned that this hadith has a weakness in it, but the principle is valid. 
and we can add to that also sadaqah on their behalf and al-hajj and al-umrah on their behalf and these are, this is also mentioned in other ahadith of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that's what we have time for in this episode in the next episode we're going to talk about how the salaf al-salih rahimahumullah used to do birr al-walidain some examples of birr al-walidain in the salaf so amthila examples of birr al-walidain in the salaf al-salih rahimahumullah ta'ala and I found that to be an amazing uh, topic when I was researching it. So we hope that inshallah it will be of benefit for everyone. That's what Allah made easy for me to mention. And Allah knows best. Was salatu was salam ala bina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.